Hey everybody, it's Andy Kushner, host of The Wedding Biz. So good to be on the air again talking to you. And I'd like to give you a chance to email me because I would love to know who else would you like on the show? Who would you like me to interview? Any other topics to cover? Anything that you enjoy I'm doing that you would like me to continue to do? Uh, please email me at andy at theweddingbiz.com. Again, that's andy at theweddingbiz.com. I will return every single email, I promise. Just give me some, a few days. I might need a little time, uh, but I would love to hear from you. So I want to mention last week's episode, if you missed it. It was Philip Van Nostrand, a wonderful, wonderful photographer out of New York City and Los Angeles who has a very unique story, some very insightful tips for networking and for creating a far more balanced lifestyle than most of, a, of us have. It's really interesting how Philip... Um, has essentially designed his life. So be sure to check it out from last week. And before I introduce a special re-release of our amazing guest this morning, I want to urge you to listen to our follow-on segment, The Next Level, because we are so lucky to have a very special guest host talking about our, our uh, interview of the morning, and that is the consultant Cindy Novotny of Master Connection Associates, very popular speaker and consultant. Many of us have seen her at Engage and many other conferences. I interviewed Cindy for The Wedding Biz back on August 27th of this year. So be sure to check that out. And on the next level, Cindy and I tease out some of the highlights of the interview and discuss some of the main points in order to break them down and deliver specific tactics to help you raise your business to the next level. Today's guest, David Stark, a renowned New York City-based event producer and designer whose team creates events worldwide for weddings, entertainment, fashion, publishing, arts, media, and for consumer product industries. Some of his high-profile clients and events include Brad Pitt, Glenn Close, Saturday Night Live's 40th anniversary, Louis Vuitton, and high-visibility events and fundraising galas for the nation's most elite, including the Whitney Museum and the Metropolitan Opera, David has five books published so far. He's had product collaborations, including a limited edition collection of a one-of-a-kind uh, art pieces produced extensively for Bergdorf Goodman. He's been a guest expert on many television shows and featured numerous times in various major publications and was inducted into the event organization Biz Bash's Hall of Fame. Dave is incredible. And when I first met him, uh, you'll hear on this interview that I read out all of these accomplishments to introduce him, and you're about to hear <laughs> a very funny how he responded. You know, I just want to take a moment and say, wouldn't we all like to have more exposure in our markets? I mean, certainly our own handling of social media and various other tools are ways that we do gain more presence. Though, what if you could have professional outside help that you could depend on to really get you the results that you need? And I know we all are happy to get much more presence. Well, I want to tell you about our sponsor of today, OFD Consulting. They are an award-winning publicity agency that focuses on the wedding industry, and their client portfolio ranges from top-tier planners and venues to well-regarded national brands and industry thought leaders. And OFD Consulting has placed clients in a slew of popular online and offline publications, including the New York Times, Martha Stewart Weddings, Style Me Pretty, many others. And they also have a service that's dedicated entirely to B2B press for those looking to elevate their brand reputation among peers through online mentions, guest articles, podcasts, and speaking engagements. So if you are a small business and you want to get more, get your name out there, get more exposure for your brand, get your message out there, and you want to just like dip your toes in the PR waters, check out the OFD Collective, which is a three-star membership with robust educational and coaching opportunities, along with ongoing press leads. So definitely check out OFDconsulting.com. Again, that's OFDconsulting.com. And now enjoy my conversation with David Stark. I know that you're a renowned New York-based event producer and designer for over 20 years. You have a wonderful team that creates events worldwide in the fields of, of weddings, entertainment, fashion, publishing, arts, media, and consumer product industries. And some, just some of your high-profile clients and events include 
Glenn Close, Brad Pitt, uh, Saturday Night Live's 40th anniversary, quite an iconic event, uh, major corporations, uh, high visibility events and fundraising galas for some of the nation's most elite not-for-profit organizations, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Metropolitan Opera. You're also a wonderfully successful author. You've had five books published. Um, from what I understand, your most recent one is called David Stark, The Art of the Party. Um, and you have product collaborations, including, among others, a limited edition collection of one-of-a-kind art pieces produced exclusively for Bergdorf Goodman. Uh, you, you've been a guest expert on numerous shows, um, things we all know, E! News, Access Hollywood, The Today Show, The View. You've been featured numerous times in various publications and, and high design, uh, design-focused blogs. You, you were in inducted into the event organization Biz Bash's Hall of Fame. You've been pretty busy. It's exhausting. <laughs> Just to listen to that. <laughs> Can you believe you've done that much? You, you didn't even know. Um, but but tell me where, I, I want to go way back. Like, like uh -huh. I want to know where you grew up and, and what first sparked this interest. Like, where did sure. you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, I grew up in a town called East Brunswick, Mm -hmm. uh, central New Jersey, then also in Princeton. And, um, ultimately I went to art school. I, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't know that the event industry existed. I didn't know mm -hmm. that weddings were a thing. I didn't know that all of these events, these things that I do now, I didn't realize that was a field. Um, ultimately my dream was to go to art school and be an artist. Um, what kind of artist? You know, in, in the beginning, I didn't really know. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design. And when I got there, um, it was like going to an intellectual spa and all of these things that um, I didn't know about from filmmaking to graphic design to industrial design to puppet making. I mean, you name wow. it. I liked everything and it was really hard to pick a major. Huh. But I ultimately ended up being a major in painting and I got a BFA in painting from RISD and um, you know, pretty much everything that I do, I do to the utmost of my ability. So at the time in which I was going to be a painter, I did the painting, you know, I was a painter to the fullest possible way. What kind of painting are we way. talking about? I did everything from, um, abstract paintings to figurative paintings to conceptual paintings. Um, hmm. you know, it was a great time to explore all kinds of things. Of course, I took it really serious as like, you know, my work was all about X, Y, Z of whatever yeah. it was about at the time. But, you know, in retrospect, it was, I was exploring a lot of different things and I ended up moving to New York city to go to graduate school. Um, and I went to the school of visual arts to get an MFA in painting. Uh -huh. And, um, about the second that I graduated from graduate school, I realized I didn't want to be a painter. Oh my gosh. So, the moment you graduated. Pretty much. I mean, I kind of held on to it for a year or so. Yeah. Um, I would be in my studio and I would have one hand on a paintbrush and I'd have another hand on a telephone and I was calling anybody that would talk to me um, and keep me company while I was making a painting by myself. But what I learned in that time period was that I didn't want to be alone in a studio, uh, but I wanted to collaborate with other people. I see. Yeah. Um, while I was a painter for a couple of years, um, I also was a waiter and I worked in all kinds of fabulous restaurants in New York and whatever was the hotspot, I worked at it. And when the new hotspot opened, they asked me to work at it. And, mm. you know, when I was 21 years old, it was fun and exciting and it was an instant social life. And somewhere along the way, I had a boyfriend who was also a painter uh -huh. and uh, at some point he decided he wanted to get more involved in working with flowers. And I got him the opportunity to audition uh, for the restaurant owner that I had worked with. He was also on the side opening other restaurants and I got him the opportunity to audition to do the flowers. That was what was destined to be the next five-star restaurant in New York, which turned out to be the next three-star restaurant oh. in New York. <laughs> um, but it was built all around flowers. And for six or eight months, it, it was kind of the toast of the town. And lots and lots and lots of people asked who did the flowers and they gave out cards. And um, if somebody called, I would help him write the proposal. And if he got the job, I would help him do the job. And huh. Um, little by little, you know, everything was tiny. It was a little tiny birthday party here and it was a little wedding there and it was a ever so slightly bigger wedding after that. And it was an ever so slightly bigger corporate event. And 
Um, and we put in, you know, the kind of energy and love and commitment as if these were like $10 billion mm, weapons. Love that. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't know the difference. We didn't know that that there were million dollar weddings out there. We just approached it with the kind of commitment and seriousness and love that we would put into making art in our studio. Hmm. Uh, and so little by little that grew and more people called. And if we had more jobs and I had to give up my shift on a Saturday night, um, I got somebody to sub for me at the restaurant. Yeah. And until ultimately I started uh, giving up shifts as we got busier and busier and realized we were going to really do this as a business. Hmm. Um, 12 years later, we built, uh, a successful business and our relationship ended and we parted ways. Uh -huh. And I continued on in a business, different name on the door, different phone number, ultimately similar business. But instead of the former name on the door, it was my name on the door. And what about building a team and all of it? It sounds to me like first it was really just the two of you, or by this point, had you built up to the point of having a support staff and. Um, you know, in the beginning, it was just the two of us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course there was the first employee <laughs> and then there was the second employee. I, I'm actually proud to say that the first the very first employee that we ever hired is a, an extraordinarily talented woman. And she is still with me today. Wow. Um, so we've gone through quite a journey together mm. over the years. Um, and I'm very blessed to have a certain amount of people that are still part of our team that were part of that original team. Um, of course, you know, so many years later, there are a lot of other people who have joined the team. Some of them are still here today. Some of them are not. Um, but, you know, what I really did learn at art school was not necessarily to paint, but what I learned to do is to solve problems creatively and how to put together teams and how to, um, you know, invent things. And so that process is what kind of carries me through to today. Um, putting together a team is perhaps the most creative act that you can pull off. And, you know, we do a lot of big things and we do them all over the place. And, and truthfully, I'm the first to say that it's a team sport. I could never do it without the people around me who are smart and passionate and talented and hardworking and, you know, are incredible people. You know, though, it's, it's such a complicated thing, in, in my opinion, to put together a team of creatives. And at the same time, here you are at heart, a creative person, an artistic mm -hmm. person. How did you learn how to, in a sense, combine business with creativity and do that? You know, I am a little bit of a weirdo in that I can turn my right brain and left brain on and off quite easily. And so, you know, although at heart, I'm an artist, mm -hmm. I'm also a business person, but I've also been taught by many great people along the way. So you had mentors, you're saying? Um, I had mentors. I had, uh, you know, I've been lucky enough to surround myself with um, business people who, from my accountant, who has been with me, you know, for 20 some odd years mm. to um, people that I've strategically hired to be general managers and to put a structure to what is essentially a creative business mm -hmm. that I didn't necessarily know how to do myself. Uh -huh. um, as the business grew and as I realized that we wanted to break out of sort of the mom and pop uh, model, uh, I looked at myself in the mirror one day as I was shaving and I said, you know, I mean, big companies do this all the time. They have people who are, they have job titles and they're responsible for things. And those job titles are not just for the people outside in the world to know what they do, but they're actually for those people to know what they do. Yeah, sure. And that, you know, I, as an artist coming into this, I always thought, oh, well, the business side of it, that's going to be stiff. That's going to be the thing that I don't want to do. Mm. But that's actually truly creative. Yes, it is. But, but tell me more. Can you give me some specifics? Business, I've learned so many years later, is not about everything working perfectly. It's about looking at it as if it's a scale out of balance. There's always going to be something that's out of balance. So part of the challenge, part of the anxiety, but part of the joy is having a challenge and figuring out how to fix it. In, in 
variably, when you fix something that's gone wrong, something else goes wrong. But the creativity behind finding those solutions to that those problems and building that better mousetrap um, is, you know, a driving factor behind doing the work. In addition, of course, to make money, which we all want to do. Yeah. But you know, you ultimately want to be interested in what you're doing. You want to be challenged, and you want to understand that you can grow, that you can reach new heights, that you can sure maybe make more money, but you could also have bigger accomplishments. And you can't do that without structure. I like what you're saying about how the way you approach it, the way how you view it, business is that it is a form of creativity, you know, which gives it a whole different light. I think so many of us, I know I was guilty of it for a period of time. Uh, I didn't recognize the creativity in the development of my business, right. you know, or, or looking at other businesses. And then after many years and a lot of trials and tribulations, then I start to realize that, yeah, if you take a creative perspective on it, um, you know, which is another form of embracing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes so much more enjoyable and at the same time, yeah, it, it, why wouldn't that be uh, an expression of the artist with Well, and hopefully the structure, the business structure that you have gives you the tools and the freedom uh, to be a more creative artist mm. and to accomplish all kinds of things you never thought you could accomplish. Um, you know, it really does go hand in hand. Um you know, the way we break down our business here internally is, you know, there is a department of project managers who work very closely with us to plan the projects that we do. Uh -huh. And there's a design department that works very closely with us to design the, the projects that we plan. Mm -hmm. Those things work hand in hand in the same way that the business arm of the creative arm and, and the creative arm. Mm -hmm. of the company work hand in hand. You know, there's no event that doesn't function both on the business structural budgeting side, uh -huh. the logistics side, and then the creative face of it. And, you know, I learned a long time ago that to be truly healthy in that world and to do the best job that I could do creatively, I have to have a structure and um, a foundation from which we can create from. Mm, a set of processes. A set of processes and, um, you know, something that grounds us to ultimately what we're here to do, which is provide a service. But this is still such a tough struggle, I think, for so many artists who, in order to thrive, must obviously build a serious business and understand you were talking about budgets. How did you learn about the financial side or do you have a lot of help from financial experts? Or is that also something that you embrace to, to really well, understand? That was, scares a lot of artists. Uh, yeah, it's, it's scary. Um, <laughs> look, I always want to offer the most that we possibly can to our clients. Mm -hmm. I want to give the most value. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to eat. <laughs> and eat and well, I, And I want to be too. able to compensate our employees for their hard work. And I want to be able to buy pencils to write notes with. <laughs> I want to get a computer. You know, like I want to do all of those things. Yeah. You know, a long time ago, I turned to other people that had more experience in that than I mm -hmm. to give a structure. Now, I was the leader in terms of establishing what my goals were. Uh huh. You know, I didn't look to somebody else to say, what should I do? Give me a system. Yeah. I basically said, listen, these are my goals. This is what I want to accomplish as a, an artist, as a business person. Help me find a structure to that. When I realized that I was trying to um, invent the wheel, but the wheel has been long invented, I could turn to somebody who already knew how to make a wheel to help me find a structure. Does that make sense? It does. Can you for a moment, though, tell me if you remember what were those goals and objectives in the especially in the earlier days? They were ultimately to figure out how to empower the teams ah. to budget for and to lead a process so to take, for them to take responsibility, ownership, to take a That's sense right. of ownership. That's right. So instead of everything being so central to my partner and myself and having a lot of grand assistance, mm. it was how do we empower people that work for this company to own their responsibilities, both inwardly and outwardly, and 
to shift from a paradigm where everybody was an assistant to everybody had roles and responsibilities. So did you set up a compensation package that would uh, motivate and uh, reward them for doing things in the most it's very productive, but cost efficient way. I mean, did they have that kind of no? Yes, no. It, it wasn't so much about dangling carrots in front of them to have them perform better, if mm-hmm. you will. That that wasn't the goal. But the goal was, you know, truthfully, it was very much about how we, my partner and I, could shift our the way we functioned, and and did trust in those around us to. Um, own certain aspects of the responsibilities that were on our collective plates. Uh Um, You know, it was a reorganization. It was an allocation of who would be in charge of various areas of the business. It was training ourselves internally on that. It Uh was training longtime clients that we'd worked with externally on that. Mm -hmm. Um, It was putting together budgeting processes and flows of communication and hierarchies of how we would do what we would do and when we would do it. This all sounds very complicated. Um, it is and it isn't. You know, some of it was common sense. Yeah. Um, and then some of it remains complicated to this day. Can you give some examples, anything in particular that jumps out at you to help illustrate these points? Sure. Somebody calls because they're getting married and they want to talk to us about um, potentially working with them on their wedding. Mm-hmm. What happens? Who takes that call? Can you actually take me through the process? Sure. From at that whole time. Pre- well, yeah. And, and at that time, and then also uh, how you've adjusted it and what that process is today. That would be interesting. Okay. I, I'm not so sure that that's going to be an easy. Uh, well, I know I'm asking for a lot here. Yeah. Thing. It's okay. Um, you know, I was the original project manager. I was the original and only project manager. Did it all. Yep. Uh-huh. So I took that call or return that call. Mm -hmm. Um, I gave the spiel about what we do and how we do it. I made the appointment for us collectively as a team to meet that person. You know, then we would go back and we would conceive of what to do and write a proposal. Mm -hmm. You know, at that time we were very focused and really only about flowers. So, you know, the world was different at that time. And you know, we were two guys working out of the trunk of our car. (laughs) And, um, so, you know, the amount of, um, balls in the air were less, although it felt Mm. like a lot. Yeah. Um, and then my partner, you know, he was the one that went to the flower market and he would do the research on the various materials that we might use. And he would ultimately, cost out what they were and he would ultimately make samples and he'd figure all of that out. And, um, he would be the one that would hire the freelancers that would come and help actually work on a job. Mm. And together we would organize like renting a van. One of us would go pick up the van. Uh, (laughs) This is the romantic period. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, real small, but the beginning. Yeah. Um, but there was, you know, a divide between what the two of us did. And then when we had our very first employee, Mm -hmm. there was ultimately a divide of what she did as well. Mm. Um, and so many years later and 50 employees in 50. Okay. Um, you know, there's a different divide of, of the work. So how does it go today? Let's say that, uh, I don't want to say a high profile client, but, um, a, a high end, uh, an upper end budget that you personally are involved in. How does that kind of a process go now? Uh, well now essentially either myself or Lauren, who's our chief operating officer, um, would receive the, the inquiry mm-hmm. and we would talk to them and we'd find out what their goals were. You know, we're, before, back in the day, it was all about, you know, decorating something. But now we're very focused on what the goals are. And the goals are many different kinds of things. Um, they sometimes are their, their destination projects. Sometimes they are about telling the story of what a non-for-profit organization does. Sometimes it's a corporate event that's launching a product. Sometimes uh-huh. it's a couple getting married. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there are certain aspects of their story that they would like to tell. And so for us, what we do find as a commonality is that our business is very much about 
for our clients, regardless of which sphere of, of entertaining they're, they're inquiring about, it's very much about storytelling. And so it's my job and Lauren's job to try to understand what their goals are, uh, when this event is, how many people, and kind of feel out whether they seem like they're the right match for us and we for them. Ah, that's an interesting point right there. Let's say that it's a wedding. Could we use a wedding as an example? Can you tell me more how that would go? The bride and groom come in, maybe the bride's parents, you know. You know, 25 years ago, I tried to be everything for all people. (laughs) So, um, but, but these days I understand more endemically that one can't be all things for all people. And so my job is in trying to suss out an inquiry is, is whether or not the folks in question want to go on the kind of creative journey that we offer to our clients. Um, that is not right for everybody. Some people when hiring a designer or an event planner, mm-hmm. you know, have a laundry list of things that need to get checked off. Mm. Um, and you know, they might need centerpieces for their table, but they want to cross it off. The I see. List. They want someone to kind of execute their very specific. Well, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Sometimes they don't have any ideas, but they know that they're going to have 24 dining tables and they know they need a centerpiece for it. Hmm. And so that is yet one of the things on the list and must be checked off. Uh But they are not necessarily interested in going on a creative journey Mm. to invent something that's very specific, to invent an environment that is an expression of who they are as people and tells a story about who they are as people and communicates that to their guests. Yeah. And I'm not putting both of those um, dichotomies out there to say that one is better than the other. They're both really great Mm -hmm. and they're right for the people that they're right for. Yeah. I'm just cognizant that we offer and love to go on the kinds of creative explorations that have an end result that is of invention and is about a particular group of people at a particular period of time. And is less about decorating for the sake of decorating, um, which ultimately for me feels like a little bit more of an empty experience. Mm. Yeah. You know, I liken what we do and I think a lot about moving day. And I I spoke about this at Engage. Um, Moving day is that day that's really hard. You're moving a lot of boxes. You're going up and down the stairs. You're packing and unpacking. Uh You're dusting. You're loading trucks. You're unloading trucks. You're breaking your back. Planning a big wedding designing a big wedding, installing a big wedding, all it really was, was moving day. If we can't stand back together as a team and say, wow, look at what we created together. Then all it really was, was moving. Mm, Yeah. So we've all moved and some of us many times and nobody really likes it. They might like the end result of the move, but Uh like the day of moving, it's not going to be the best day. Yeah. So, um, my goal is to ultimately create an experience for us that we're going to all remember for the rest of our lives. The process itself is memorable too. That the day, the end result, and that the journey to get there Uh was. You know, I say this all the time and I really do mean it. A party lasts five or six hours, but the journey to get there could be a year. Mm. It could be eight months. It could, you know, in today's expedited timeline, it could be four months, but it could be a year and two months, but it's definitely more than five hours. Uh Uh-huh. And so we're going to spend a lot more time together on the road to the event than we're going to spend at the event itself. And so you want to have company on that journey with people who you trust, people who you enjoy spending time with, yeah. people that um, you'll be inspired by, uh. people that you'll be challenged by, people that will have your back, um, people that will make magic where you didn't think you needed magic. You know, I can keep going on and on, but ultimately you want to discover something in that process and the fruits of your labor of discovery come alive at that wedding day. Is there a particular one you don't have to name name of a client, but uh, I'm sure you have an incredible amount of favorite ones, but any in particular that you could tell some specific story about that would help illustrate a lot of these elements and points? Well, probably, you know, one of my all time favorite projects was a a wedding that we did in the Detroit area. And, um, it was at a very beautiful home and, you know, 
Of course, I see many beautiful homes and I see a lot of beautiful stuff, but it's very rare that I see something that so strikes my own personal chord. Huh. My goal is to never bring my own, you know, like my own personal aesthetic, the things that I jive with or are inspired by. I mean, those have a place in my home and at my party, but they don't necessarily have a place for me to roll out to everybody else. Sure. So... Of course, it's filtered through my head and my hand and my heart, but it is very rare that I so um, link and am inspired by what I encounter as part of our process in planning. And so this particular family, the mother of, of the bride, this particular home really struck a chord. And to this day, um, the mother of the bride is now one of my closest friends and collaborators. Hmm. And, oh, and collaborator, yeah. you're saying? And, and I feel very, very lucky. You know, we tend to, and, and my business philosophy is to create relationships with people. Um, I sometimes meet them over the course of planning their daughter or son's wedding. Uh -huh. I sometimes meet them over the course of working on a corporate event. I sometimes meet them when they're being honored by a certain non-for-profit. But whatever that occasion was that we met, the bond becomes quite strong that we end up working together across all of the different um, platforms of, of their entertaining, perhaps over the rest of their lives. Wow. Um, I never wanted to be that person who said, you know what, I'm going to do your corporate event, but I'm not going to do your daughter's bat mitzvah. <laughs> or I'm going to do, you know, your company party, but I'm, I don't do weddings. So my goal really was to create relationships with people. And regardless of what the milestone that was being celebrated mm -hmm. or the business activation that needed to be, well, the business that needed to be activated. Yeah, sure. That I wanted to be there for that. And I think a lot about theater and it's very much about creating the stage set or the environment or the set of circumstances that are right for that particular play. Uh -huh. So not every stage set, not every group of props, not every circumstance is right for every single play in the world, uh -huh. right? Everything has its own unique mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm real focused and so is the team on finding out the true particularities of that experience. What are those goals? What are the things that make it unique? And finding ways to bring that to life in really exceptional ways that are unique and special to that moment in time. And, and again, do you mind either using the Detroit example or another one where you could kind of give a specific story where you experienced all of this, perhaps that one party you started to talk about, you know, like what it is that you saw in the home and what moved you so much and, and then their own, how you told their story? Sure. So the property um, has a, a wonderful collection. First of all, it has a, a very beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. um, the garden has a lot of topiary, a lot of very um, carefully trimmed trees mm -hmm. and magical surprises throughout the garden. And those magical surprises are very often art pieces um, by, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lalans. Uh, no. They, they, he is no longer alive, but they were a couple from France that went by the name, uh, you know, they were referred to together as the Lalans. Okay. They made work together, but they each made work, but they were sort of enchanted um, pieces of sculpture that often had to do with animals. And, um, and so there are tons of those pieces wow. in the garden. So you'll turn a corner and boom. That's right. And so, you know, I have a personal interest in that work. Yeah. I have a personal, personal interest in that kind of garden. Uh -huh. um, and the whole experience, the whole place is sort of enchanted. Um, there's a lot of handmade things at, at, at the home, a lot made out of paper, which I also have a very personal interest in and have worked a lot with over the years. Uh -huh. um, an interest in humble materials that are used in sort of a, a magic wand kind of way and turned into something else. Uh -huh. and, and so the feeling of being in this full-on enchanted environment um, did provide a certain basis for what the wedding turned out to be, where we were really able to play upon the, those uh, things yeah. and, and push that even further. So upon the entry, we created these giant um, topiary of, of chickens. <laughs> and so there were, you know, 15 foot tall chickens greeting guests upon arrival made out of boxwood. And in, you know, that can sound terrible, 
But, you know, I wake up in the morning with this idea that anything can be really horrible or really wonderful based upon how you do it. Uh -huh. So, you know, my goal is always to do it really beautifully. But at this property, in the way that these pieces were created in relationship to the other things that were there, they were so refined and so unexpected that ultimately they seemed so natural. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, I never want anything to seem contrived or to seem like it fell from Mars. But in this particular environment, it looked extremely uh, natural, like they were always there. And to me, in a part, that's the mark of when something's good, when you don't feel the hand or, or the body's laboring over something, that it was just naturally there. Is it? Yeah. Happened. Uh -huh. You know, Matisse used to always talk about the fact that it looked like a painting came together within five minutes when it actually took like 10 years mm, for some of these things that, that, sure. that seemed as if they just kind of momentarily, yeah. you know, just came together. Uh -huh. But he toiled over it for quite some time. He thought about it. He moved it around. But then, yes, in an instant, it came together. Mm. Uh, that is my artistic goal. I never want it to seem as if we've touched it. I want it to seem like it just happened. And you also, I remember connected to this at Engage, you talked about uh, how to bring in a 3D experience. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like this is a perfect example of it. Yeah. Well, you know, that was part of the, I, I think that what happened in my personal journey, you know, starting out working with flowers in the event world, um, of course, in the beginning, it was all about mastering working with flowers, you know, yeah. like in the beginning, the flowers rule you and you're afraid of them. <laughs> and it does take a certain amount of time to realize that A, you don't need to be afraid of them mm -hmm. and B, you learn about their characteristics and they all have different characteristics. Uh, somewhere along the way, I realized that flowers were just one of the tools in the toolbox and it was the right tool for many things, but it was not necessarily the right tool for many, many other things. Uh -huh. And when I realized that um, it was yet a tool, but the world of tools was open to use it all, that's where things started to kind of percolate for me. And um, we started to make, and, and still do today, we make events out of all kinds of things that should have never been in an event. Like what? Um, probably one of my best recent examples was for the Brooklyn museum where we made their gala out of, um, hundreds upon hundreds of rolls of, of toilet paper and paper towels. I've got to see this. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was super chic and super unexpected and it was inspired entirely by the artist Brancusi. It was all white. Um, and it, you had to take a double take. I had to tell you that it was toilet paper or paper towels for you to know. Oh, really? There was no, people couldn't tell just by looking at that. I mean, when you first looked, it just looked like these giant yeah, totems. You get the overall vibe. Um, but then, you know, you look closely and you realize, wow, God, that's like toilet paper. Huh. And so um, what I'm most proud of, you know, it's not so easy to convince people to make a whole public event out of toilet paper. <laughs> so I'm very proud of at this point that we've, um, gained the trust and the excitement of people to go on these journeys uh -huh. because they know that the end result will be something unlike anything anybody else. Yeah. They're has. giving you the freedom to really create in order to tell their story. Now with that comes huge responsibility. Uh, sure. And again, you know, going back to what I said before that anything has the ability to be horrible or wonderful <laughs> and it's how you do it that makes it such. So, you know, I, I, I take it real seriously, the responsibility of saying to somebody, we're going to make your most important event of the year out of toilet paper <laughs> and everybody's going to love it. Uh -huh. I, that would take me a moment. I, I need to deliver upon that. Uh -huh. Right. So, um, anyway, you know, the reality is that now I look at the world as what is the right tool? What is the right material? Mm -hmm. What is the right, um, what is the right conduit to tell a story uh -huh. at this wedding in the Detroit area? You know, these topiary, these oversized topiary made out of boxwood in a garden that has so much boxwood. Um, that was the right method. That was the right imagery in that scenario. Mm -hmm. That would not necessarily be the right imagery in a different scenario. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when we deal with a corporate event or we deal with a non-for-profit event, it's really important for me for the decor to have the meaning of what we're all there for implicit in the decor. 
Uh, and I've learned a lot of storytelling techniques and, and, and a lot of my skills have come from working in the non-for-profit space. But you'd say, well, well, what does that have to do with weddings? And I'd say, well, it has everything to do with them because the truth is that's the defining difference between decorating or, or telling a story. And so when I meet a couple, it's my job, you know, every once in a blue moon, somebody comes to the table with lots of ideas Lots of good ideas uh -huh. and lots of visual information, lots of anecdotes, lots of things that we can hang our hat on yeah. to bring to life on their special day. Mm -hmm. But more often than not, people come to us with the knowledge that they want to make their day personal mm -hmm. and having absolutely no idea how to get there. Mm. Love that. And so they really look to us to, to help them get there. And I learned all that working in the non-for-profit world. And, and I want to say what, what I think of immediately when you say that for a non-profit is it's a highly emotional event, right? These not-for-profit, they're raising money, most often the case, right? To support some kind of a cause that usually, usually has such a deep emotional connection for the people who are putting this on and for the people who are contributing, right? And buying the seats. So I can understand the connection between that and a wedding, which is all about emotion. Yes, it, but it, I think it goes even further than that in that, especially in the New York market, it's a very competitive market. Listen, there are a million causes out there. Ah, to they, compete for people's money. Yeah, it, there, there are a million things out there that are so important mm -hmm. that need every desperate dollar that they can get. Yeah. That there is not enough money to go to all of these things. And there are so, so many needs and they're so, and they're from everything, from medical needs to medical research, to arts organizations, to children to poverty. I mean, you name it, mm. there are more causes waiting in line than there are people and dollars for them. Yeah. I like to think that the group of people that we entertain are out nine nights a week and they've been everywhere and they've done everything. So part of the job that is unsaid is how do we make this unlike anything that they went to on Tuesday? Yes. How do we differentiate between that really, 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 really important thing that they went to on Tuesday from the really, really, really important thing that we're right. going to do on Thursday? Uh -huh. Yeah. And how do we tell that story in a unique way that stays with them when they're now going to something else tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And the way that I think you do that is by looking at the emotions of it all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I talk to my museum clients all the time. I, I sit at these meetings and people will say, you know, we want to get the heart of why this museum is important in this event. Mm -hmm. And I'll listen and I hear them talk about what they're going to do and how they're going to do. And I, I, I just take it all in. And then it occurs to me at some point, you know, you're all so incredibly passionate about this place. Uh -huh. And none of that passion comes off at all at the event, like, why don't we just flat footedly say like, why is this so important to you? Like, what is it so awesome about this place uh -huh. that moves you to be so involved? Yeah. Like, how do we get to the heart of the matter? You know, we can talk about which speakers and which entertainers and which, like at the end of the day, that, that that's gravy. That's the cherry on the Sunday. Mm -hmm. But what really people want to know is what's engaging you from the heart. Yes, yes. Why are you passionate about that? If you can convey your passion, uh -huh. then they will be catching that excitement. And I think it's the same in a wedding. People are in love. That's why they're getting married. Yeah. There is something unique about that. You want to share that with them. You want to celebrate that with them. And you want to declare that to the world. Mm -hmm. So beyond the fact that we're going to serve chicken... And beyond the fact that you love peonies, like what else? Yeah. That's our job. I think as event planners, as designers, it's our job to find the uniqueness in the theater of that experience. Mm. So the wedding you were talking about where outside the entrance they had, uh, if I'm saying this correctly, it, it made out of boxwood, these large chickens. I'm, I'm curious what happened when they then walk inside? Or, or was that the inside, the immediate inside? Uh, well, they, they actually walked through all of these different garden rooms. Ah, so just like their so gardens was, at their home, you brought them That's right. Through. So, I mean, there was a journey through that garden. They I got love to that. discover lots of beautiful surprises. And 
Um, some of it, you know, some of the things were not complicated. They had a very beautiful tree house. But it doesn't have to be complicated, right? And we stuck the museums right? in the tree, the musicians in the tree house. Uh, yeah, a little great idea. And there was a, you know, a herd of Lalan sheep on one, in one garden. And so we had the sheep and then we had the musicians up above. Are we talking about real sheep? No, the, the <laughs> I, I was going to say. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there was like a beautiful journey and everywhere you went through the garden, you discovered something new. Sometimes uh, that was something that we made. Uh -huh. Sometimes that was a sculpture that was there. Sometimes it was a musical moment. Mm. Um, but, you know, like sprites going through a garden, you discovered things on that journey till you ultimately got to the ceremony. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and then the ceremony takes on, not that it's a different context than any other, but they arrive and, and it's a whole nother thing that they've been prepared for emotionally, you know, in a way. Right. I like that. You know, and you were talking about with the nonprofits and uh, an experience that people need to have that, again, differentiates between maybe that night and next Thursday. I was brought in for something in Las Vegas that was really big. And I had asked what they had done before. And it was kind of like a formulaic. It was one of these high roller New Year's parties. It was a formulaic thing with a bunch of dancers and the band and the way it would go. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, wait a minute, these are, and I found out the demographics. These were extremely wealthy people. I mean, the casino knew all the details. So I, I was given all this information and I, I thought to myself, these people have, at first I was intimidated. They have seen everything. They've seen everything on the Las Vegas strip and at this particular casino, they've been all over the world. Like you say, they've seen event after event. They've seen the best of the best of the best. What can I do this one particular night to make it different? And I thought, I mean, it, it, it's create an experience. It, 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 it can't have a price to it, right? It's got to right. be a unique experience that only they get within that brief amount of time right. that is going to make them feel something and feel in that case with the casino, feel appreciated so that they stay and, and stay there with the high rollers. Um, you also mentioned at Engage um, that you want to be a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Sure. I mean, the artist in me knows that if I'm a little bit nervous, it means that I haven't done something before, which means that ultimately I'm going to be making something new. That's going to be the innovation. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm not nervous, I've done it before. Uh. So that's not, that's not a risky gamble. You know, not doing something before, that's not at risk to anybody because, you know, there's 20 some odd years of experience that... Um, thoughtfully goes into every decision that we make. But what I really try to avoid to do at all costs is sort of the rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, like doing, you know, do the same thing again and change the color. Which is safe, but well, it's it, not artistically it, it's, interesting for you then, right? Well, it means that I didn't get to the heart of the matter of what something is about. Mm. If I'm repeating something that I've done before, uh, then I repeated that. Right. Thing. It's not unique to this particular. Hmm. You know, but, but listen, it's, it's, there are things that we take on our journey with us. There are learnings and materials that we put in the suitcase and we take it on the road and uh -huh. we think about how it can be used in a different way elsewhere. Um, and sometimes we do something that's very small and then we think, oh, that's a good material that we could actually really play with more. Yeah. And we do it in a much larger scale. Mm. And, um, but you know, I want to be a little nervous all the time, <laughs> not nervous that we're going to fail, but nervous that we're going to succeed. Mm. I want to know that we're going to make something new. What, what can you uh, tell me an example about one in particular where you were particularly nervous? <laughs> Anything like that? Anything stick out to you when I say that? Yeah. I mean, recently we did a, an event for the TED conference and for um, our friends at the Target Corporation in Vancouver. Uh -huh. And it was the design dinner um, that was co-hosted by Target and um, the Cooper Hewitt Museum. And, you know, it was for a very Tony crowd, um, you know, the thinkers at the Ted conference are, you know, at the highest level of yeah. what's going on right now. Mm. Um, and you know, the mission was to create something that breathed new excitement into this dinner. We had never done it before. Um, and we decided to have a progressive dinner. Are you familiar with? N well, I have, I, yeah, but if you could explain it, 
So I, I suppose a progressive dinner uh, is one where it starts in a certain location and moves to another location. Mm-hmm. Uh, so implicit in this dinner, what we wanted to have was a series of surprises, constantly taking the guests by storm. Um, and so what we did was we we took the room that we were in and we built a wall that separated it into two adjacent rooms. And we had long dining tables in the first room. And um, what we used to uh, be sort of the, the cornerstone of our decor was the egg, like the, the actual fresh egg. Okay. Um, partly because the egg is, is I think, considered um, the most perfect design element of nature. Hmm. And we wanted to also work with local farms. Uh-huh. And we wanted to make something that was just beautiful and surprising. And so um, the decor was made out of thousands upon thousands of fresh eggs. Wow. And so we built a wall that um, was constructed of thousands of eggs that separated the room. The dining tables um, had centerpieces that were undulating waves of eggs. And at every place setting was an egg in an egg cup. Okay. And at a particular point in the evening, the guests were each given a wooden mallet and ceremoniously asked to break the egg in their egg cup at the same time. Huh. And that revealed to them their seating assignment for oh, the next room. Great. Yeah. And so yeah. they then went into the next room and had new guests to sit with for that dinner. Huh. And there was, you know, that was a room all about brown eggs. And so there were things like that that kept happening all night long. Uh-huh. So, you know... Uh, Linked to what something looks like is very much what happens, right? Okay. So, you know, the the egg could have been thought of simply as a decorative object, but it actually became very much part of what this evening was exploring. Yeah. It became very much about the menu. It became the way that people found their seating assignments, Mm -hmm. um, amongst other things. Um, But I was nervous. Yeah, I can guess. But specifically, what were you nervous about? Um, oh, many things. <laughs> what would they think of the eggs? What would, oh, would they, the concept even work? Would they be able to break the eggs? Oh. Would they break the eggs upon sitting down uh, before they were good point? You know, asked to do it later. <laughs> oh, where well, there's mallets would they sitting throw there. Eggs at each other. <laughs> you know, you. I mean, at some point we were going to have the mallets at each place setting, and then we decided, you know what, let's not do Better that wait. because that's going to tempt fate. So yeah. let's bring them out only at the time in which we want them to break uh-huh. them. Yeah. So, um, you know, will I ever do it again? Probably not. Um, but what did I learn from it? I learned that people like surprise. Yes. And so that aha moment when the hosts ask them to take the mallet that they were given and on the count of three, everybody break the egg and to find their new seating assignment in the room beyond that they didn't know existed. Uh The, the squeals of joy and the ahs um, that came from this group of adults. That must've felt so good. Was, you know, worth it all. Yeah. And for me, ultimately that's what's exciting is if I could take a group of the biggest, um, thinkers and design leaders throughout the world Mm -hmm. and surprise and delight them in ultimately what was probably a relatively simple way, (laughs) then I think I've done my job well. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. You, you also mentioned that you never stop auditioning. What did you mean by that? You know, it's all well and good that I and my team prove ourselves again and again with these wacky ideas. Yeah. Um, it's all well and good that the Brooklyn Museum's paper towel extravaganza was like a wild success. Uh-huh. But the very next time that I go back in there, as much as they're great friends and partners and I love them dearly, I have to prove that the next wacky idea is worthy. Uh huh. It's not just that, you know, do they trust in what it will look like, but do they trust in what it means? hmm is it striking the right chord of the story that they want to tell, the message that they want to put out into the world? My pal, Ann Pasternak, who is the wonderful director of the Brooklyn Museum, um, it was her very first year on the job. And when we did that, you know, the goal was to, to, to show that there was a new chapter at the museum and that we were going to be doing things differently. Yeah. And so we came back to the ranch to think about, well, how can we say that? How can we do that? And, and that is what we came about. And it came about for a variety of reasons, Brancusi being one of them and another artist being honored 
also shared Brancusi as inspiration and worked all in white. And we needed a clever, inexpensive solution to absorb sound in a room that was uh, a sure. difficult room. So, I mean, all these things were sort of the perfect storm to how we got to that idea. Uh -huh. But I remember her saying to me um, the day after when the reviews were wonderful, I was so nervous that you know, the blogs and the newspapers would say um, that Anne had um, toilet papered the museum. <laughs> and I missed the whole. <laughs> um, so, you know, listen, there, there are always wacky ideas need justification. And you never stop proving yourself and again and again. If you're going to be a person of invention, if you're going to be a company of invention, mm -hmm then you constantly need to audition. You know, that old adage is you're only as good as your last party. Well, that's yeah. true. Well, and I would extend that to say taking risks, mm -hmm. calculated, but still you're taking risks. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I've chosen to make a career out of pushing boundaries. Uh huh. Mostly because that's right for me as an artist. I will say that 20 some odd years later, the world has caught up to strategies that at some time in my career, mm -hmm. nobody would listen to mm. five minutes of, or give me the time of day on, uh -huh. you know, the whole idea of using everyday materials in unexpected ways, um, was laughable, uh -huh. but you know, part of what changed in the world was the world finances. So when the market crashed, um, several years back, all of a sudden these, it became sort of gauche to display your wealth. In I remember that. Ways. Oh yeah, sure. And all of a sudden these ideas that I had about how to do things creatively now were uh, interesting ideas because they were not so much about, and, and this is my other philosophy. I never want people to walk into a room and firstly say, oh my God, look at how much they've spent. What I want people to do is walk into a room and say, I want their jaw to drop to the ground. I want to say, oh my God, that is cool. Mm -hmm. I don't want the cash register to be part of it. It can cost a lot yeah. or it could not cost a lot. But I get it. But I want, I want that to be like very down low on the list. Yeah. If people walk, I remember back in the days where like you would cover the ceiling of the Piera Hotel in Orchids simply because you could. <laughs> and to show people that you could, uh, that's yeah. what mattered. Hmm. I've always felt that that was not where I wanted to be. I don't have any judgment on it, but for me, that was more about the cash register ringing than it was about a creative solution to telling somebody's personal story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a couple more topics before we close. Um, I also remember you uh, speaking, which, which really grabbed me, that you immerse yourself in um, history and architecture. You know, to, you said to ground, I believe you said to ground yourself. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Sure. I mean, part of my background as an artist, um, you know, is, a, is an extensive understanding and immersion in art history. And, and um, I do find that I looked a lot to artists for solutions. Um, the Brooklyn Museum is a great example in that Brancusi was, you know, who was the inspiration behind what we did. Now, I don't know that the average person either A, knows who Brancusi is uh -huh. or would see that in our installation. Mm -hmm. But that is more powerful for me for ideation purposes than looking at pictures of other events and watering down things that have been done before. Uh -huh. yep. So I look to the world of art and architecture mm -hmm. and, and really everything, um, food, films, hotel lobbies, interior design, mm -hmm. landscapes, gardens, um, but art, sculpture, installation art, architecture. I mean, those are personal interests and favorites and places that are, are never ending places. And, and I look at them not from the standpoint of a shopper. It's not about what I want to personally own. And the way I look at art now is not from the standpoint of whether I love it for my personal taste, but whether it beautifully answers the questions that were posed by the artist. Mm. That's a different thing than taste. That's a different thing than shopping. Uh -huh. um, 
But sometimes the artwork that I think is most successful answers questions that are really tough questions, but they're not what I want to hang in my living room. But I think they do it in a, they, they beautifully answer the questions that are posed at that time. Um, my job as a designer and my job as an event planner is to answer other people's questions that are not my uh, own questions. Yeah. Every once in a blue moon, like the wedding in Detroit, my personal interests align so, so beautifully. Huh. But 95% of the other times, they're amazing, rewarding, challenging questions that I have to answer for other people uh -huh. that I want to do the best job I possibly can to answer them. But I put taste entirely aside. Yeah. I want to give it good taste. Uh -huh. I want to give it the best job that can be done. But my own personal taste is not part of the equation, finding the creative solution to that problem. Uh-huh. Sure. Hmm. Um, and finally, I'm wondering personally, I mean, it's not, I, I, I can tell from this conversation, you get such personal satisfaction through preparing and working through these events and the people you're dealing with. Do you have any particular ways of, I don't want to, I don't want to say typically, how do you get inspiration? It's already clear, but do you do anything particularly, whether it's travel, going to museums, are you taking time out to just go and, and, uh, inspire yourself personally? I do. I mean, I, um, of course would like more of that time off <laughs> than I can get, but I'm pretty good at, uh, finding ways to build inspiration into my world. Um, you know, this summer I'll be taking a trip to Greece and to France and to Italy. And, um, you know, it's in one part, I'm actually going to a wedding in Greece of friends and that's as a guest, as a guest, Wow, which is real fun. Yeah. <laughs> and then from there, we'll be going to visit some friends in Florence and then to visit oh. some friends in France. And while those are really fun, wonderful experiences, they're also filled with tons and tons and tons of inspiration. Oh my God, David, walking through Florence, just, I mean, obviously the museums, but just walking through the streets of Florence to me is a knockout. It's like an outside museum. Yeah. I feel that way about France, especially. I spend a lot of time in Paris and, um, you know, of course I love the museums, but just being on the street oh is being God. in a museum. Yeah. Um, but just, you know, the style and the proportions of things, you know, from a design standpoint, I look at a lot at proportions. Um, huh. uh, you know, for me, simplicity is often the way but it's really about the proportions and the materials chosen to execute on mm. that, um, you know, that we think a lot about um, and that I personally spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and, and I try to give the design work that we do a seriousness to it that goes beyond its temporary nature. Uh -huh. And I do think that to some degree, that's partly what elevates it to what I hope to be more in the realm of installation art, um, that and the, it, it's, it's um, intention to be impregnated with meaning rather than simply be a decor. Mm. Um, you know, ultimately those are the things that are my driving beats. When you take this trip, are you, how long is it going to be? And are you going to technically not be working? Although of course you're getting inspiration and you're, <laughs> I'm sure you're taking so many notes while you're there and pictures, right. And stuff like yeah. that. But is that the intention is to take a block of time and just go and be. That's always the intention, you know, running a business, I take responsibility for, um, you know, my responsibilities. <laughs> um, but the beauty of being in Europe is that you're six hours ahead. So the fabulous thing is that for almost a full day up uh -huh. until about four o'clock, uh -huh. everybody's sleeping here. Yeah. So you've pretty much had a full day before things start to get yeah, um, a little wonky. I am very blessed with a wonderful team. Uh, I am never able as a business owner to fully disappear. Mm hmm. But I am lucky enough to get large swaths of time where um, my post is covered, if you will. What is the best way for people to uh, learn, uh, people who might want to know more about you or to go ahead and get a hold of these books or, or if you have talks that are recorded, what is the best way for people to find out about you? All of our books are available on Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. um, 
the two most recent books, The Art of the Party and David Stark Design, are truly about our process as a, as a, a group of artists and how we work with our clients. Um, they echo the things that you and I have spoken about today. Um, and they show finished products, but they show a lot of the process to get to the, uh -huh. the finished product, which I think oftentimes those photographs are perhaps more interesting than the finished product. I, hmm. I often think that the look under the hood of the car is a pretty fascinating thing. Hmm. So certainly those are available on Amazon. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, we have tons of information on our website. Uh, which links to all of those things as well, which is davidstarkdesign.com. Thank you for listening to my conversation with David Stark. I want to urge you to check out his many products and services at his website of David Stark Design. That's davidstarkdesign.com. And be sure to check out our show notes and our website at theweddingbiz.com. And don't forget our network featuring our host, Julie Sabatino of The Stylish Bride at theweddingbiznetwork.com. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, which I know you did, we would love if you would share it with your friends and colleagues. So also enjoy the Next Level episode that goes with this one, and we'll catch you next week. Next Level.